Howdy folks, this is version two, I guess, because the first audio didn't record of how to draw Lewis structures. Uh, so here we can see that we have my notes here. Uh, this is just briefly me explaining how to draw a Lewis structure. So a couple steps. First thing, count the total number of valence electrons. Uh, the method that I'm using, we're gonna use some slight variation on that step. Put the least electronegative atom in the center, always carbon, sometimes oxygen or nitrogen. We'll talk about what is deemed as the central atom and what are the outside ones or the terminal atoms. Draw a line between bonding atoms. Uh, we will explain what a bond is, what it looks like, how many electrons it's worth, usually determined through singular electrons. So we'll look at the singular electrons and show them bonding together. Uh, complete the octets. We'll talk about the octet rule and what that means. Move electrons from outer atoms to form double or triple bonds with the central atom to complete the central atoms octet. We'll talk about all of those different things, where they fit in um, and how they look. So in terms of finding the central atom, what we're concerned with here and, and sort of what a good reminder is that we're dealing with nonmetals and nonmetals. We're dealing with either molecular or covalent bonding. Those two words mean the same thing. And so we're dealing with two nonmetals that want to bond and come together. And so what we're concerned about is we want to know, well, what atom needs to go in the middle? And so a good rule for us is that it's always going to be carbon and it will sometimes be oxygen or nitrogen. And if we don't have those elements present, we can draw our very poorly drawn periodic table here. When we're looking at electronegativity, electronegativity refers to the ability of atoms to attract electrons to themselves. And so the rule is we want to put the least electronegative atom in the middle. And so the pattern of electronegativity is this that as you go up the periods and across the rows, that the electronegativity increases. And so what that would mean is that fluorine, which is this guy here, would be the least, or excuse me, the most electronegative. What we don't count is we don't look at any of these noble gases over on the right because they're stable. They don't want to give, nor do they want to receive any more electrons than they already have. The only really weird exception to this electronegativity rule is hydrogen, which is in this corner. Hydrogen's often less electronegative than a lot of the central atoms, but because hydrogen's Bohr diagram uh, and its Lewis structure looks like this, we know that hydrogen really only wants to receive or share one other electron to complete that inner circle. Uh, if you remember Bohr diagrams, they follow the rule of 288, which means that in this first ring, you want two electrons. The second ring, you want eight. Where that eight comes into play then is with our octet rule. Uh, so what elements and what these atoms always want to have is they always want to have eight electrons surrounding them. So that's our rule. They want to have eight electrons surrounding each atom. And what that allows that, uh, what it allows them to do is that allows them to behave as though they are a noble gas. All of the noble gases have eight valence electrons around them. And if a, any other atom on the periodic table also then has eight electrons surrounding it, or it has a full valence shell, then it will be very stable and not want to react and not want to change. And that's ultimately our goal with these structures is to have stable structures that no, want, no longer want to react, uh, no longer want to gain more or share more electrons. And so the idea is that there's two ways that we can do that. So if we have lone pair electrons, electrons those each count for those each count for one electron if we have a bond that's going to equal two electrons so if we look specifically at carbon here carbon normally has four valence electrons so this is the normal structure of carbon and so what we'd expect then is that these singular electrons are going to find other singular electrons uh, somewhere in the universe and they're going to form bonds with them so one two, three, and four. And if they're able to do that, then what that means is now it has eight surrounding electrons. Again, each bond is worth two electrons. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight valence electrons surrounding that carbon. If we have nitrogen, nitrogen has a valence structure that looks like this. It's got five valence electrons surrounding it. And so we form one of the pairs. 
Normally what'll happen is these singular electrons will all form bonds, one, two, three. And then if we count the electrons around it, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, eight up top. So there's eight surrounding electrons. That's what the octet rule is. There are a few that break the octet rule. So they break the octet rule. And those ones are uh, a children's program, which is PBS and then also Br. So phosphorus, bromine, sulfur, and also uh, ph phosphorus, boron, sulfur, and also bromine. Uh, showing you them on the periodic table. So phosphorus is here, sulfur is here, boron's up here, and bromine's down here. Phosphorus is underneath nitrogen, but it's slightly bigger, so it has less control over how many electrons surround it. Phosphorus, we typically expect to have 10 electrons surrounding it. Sulfur, we'd expect to have 12. Boron being in this third column here, it's also the only non-metal in the third column. You'll notice aluminum or aluminum is below it. Uh, boron, will expect to have only six electrons surrounding it. So phosphorus, we said, normally this guy will have 10 electrons. Boron, it'll have six electrons. Sulfur, it'll have uh, 12 electrons. And bromine is a weird one in that it can have 14 electrons surrounding it. So those are the exceptions to the rule. Those won't come up very often in assignments and stuff, but um, you can see here, these are what the normal structures look like. So moving down, we're going to do some practice problems here. We'll talk about polarity. We'll also talk about shape as well as drawing these Lewis dot diagrams. So I said that there were a couple common central atoms. They were always, uh, always carbon, always carbon. And it was sometimes oxygen and nitrogen. So that's kind of our rule for finding out what the central atom is. If we look at this first compound here, SIS2, we see we have absolutely no carbons, oxygens, or nitrogens. And so there we need to move to this electronegativity difference to pick out what the central atom will be. If we go to our periodic table, we can see sulfur is right here and we can see silicon is right here. So it's because silicon is further left, it has a lower electronegativity. So we know that we wanna put this silicon in the middle. And then what we also wanna look at is we wanna look at drawing the valence structure of it. Silicon's in this column 14 below carbon. It has the exact same structure as carbon. So it'll have four valence electrons. One, two, three, and four. And then sulfur, we wanna look at drawing two of those guys. Sulfur's here, we can see that it's beneath oxygen. And so it'll have the exact same valence electrons. It'll have six valence electrons. So if we draw our first sulfur here, I'm gonna draw this one properly. One, two, three, four. And now that I'm at four, I wanna start pairing up these ones, five and six. Okay, so I can see that. And then I'll draw the exact same structure over here. Okay, so now what we wanna start doing is we wanna start pairing up the singular electrons that are present. I can see these two electrons right here are probably gonna to wanna to form a bond, so I'm gonna draw a line between them and clean that up a little bit. So there's the line between them there. And then we can see the exact same thing on the opposite side, we got two singular dots. So we're gonna draw a line and a bond between them. Now we have a couple other singular electrons and the idea is we wanna make these meet up. So we have this singular electron and this singular electron over here. We can form a bond between those two singular electrons as well. And so we're gonna do that and I'm gonna clean this up and draw a bond right here. We're gonna do the exact same thing on the other side with this electron and that electron there. We're gonna form a bond between those. Boom, just like that. So we kind of have a structure now. The, the idea now is to check and make sure that there are in fact eight valence electrons or eight electrons surrounding each atom. So if we look solely at the silicon first, we see that we have one, two, three, four bonds around it. And because there's four different bonds, each bond being worth two electrons, we can see that this silicon does in fact have eight surrounding valence electrons. If we look at the sulfur then, we can see that we have two bonds, so that's equal to four electrons. Again, each bond is worth two electrons. And then we have, uh, we have these electrons up here as well. So we have eight total. So this is one, two, uh, and then we'll call this one. So yeah, each, each of these bonds is worth two electrons. So 
Uh, we have the same sulfur over here, so we're gonna have the exact same number of valence electrons, beautiful. The next thing that we wanna do, once we've confirmed that yes, we got our appropriate central atom, our electronegativity, the least electronegative is in the middle, we have an octet rule satisfied for all of the elements present. The next thing we wanna check is we wanna look for polarity. And so what we're looking for is we look at this central atom and we wanna look only at the central atom when we're looking at polarity. And we wanna look, is there any asymmetry anywhere? If I slice this this way, is it the exact same on both sides? And yes, in fact it is. If I slice this yep, that way, is it the same on both sides? Yes, it is. If I slice it this way, is it the exact same on both sides? And yes, it is. So we don't have any asymmetry, it's symmetrical all the way around. The other thing we wanna check is, are there any lone pairs of electrons on this silicon? There are not, great, so we know we won't have a pole in any direction. Last thing to check, is there any uh, metals bonded to non-metals? Because those will create ionic bonds and those are always polar and we can see that we have no ionic bonds anywhere. So this molecule then is non-polar. When we look at the shape, we wanna go to our data table and reference booklet and we wanna scroll all the way down to the diagram that looks like this here. And what we're looking at here is we want to see uh, what does our shape look like. So if we look at this Lewis structure, we look at the central atom and see there's one, two different arms coming off of this. Yeah, they're double bonds, so, but that's not four arms. That's still just two arms coming off of our central atom. So there's two arms coming off of our central atom here, meaning we know that we have a linear and there's no lone pairs on that silicon. So we have a linear, linear shape. Okay, and we have a linear, linear shape. That's it for the shape of that one. Uh, next thing to look at here, we're gonna do this uh, CF4. Again, our rule for the central atom is that it's always carbon, sometimes oxygen, sometimes nitrogen. So we have a carbon here, we're gonna put that guy in the center, going over to our periodic table. We can see carbon column 14, it'll have four valence electrons. So one, two, three and four, and then we have four fluorine. So let's find fluorine on here. Over in column 17, it'll have seven valence electrons. Scroll down a bit. So we're gonna draw one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, just like that. So that's what all the fluorines are gonna look like. What I'm gonna do is I'm already seeing the potential that we're probably gonna have a bond here. And so I'm gonna draw my other fluorines and on each of them, I'm gonna put that singular dot closest to carbon's singular dot. So you can see that all I'm doing is just rotating the placement of these electrons. Uh, and all I'm doing, the reason I'm doing that is just to make my life a little bit easier when we see that we have those two there that are gonna to wanna to form a bond. And we'll do the exact same thing you can see on all three of the remaining sides that we're gonna have that bond being formed. So we can fill that in there this, like this, and like this. So last thing to check then is to make sure that in fact we do have eight valence electrons around this carbon. There's one, two for this bond, three, four for this bond, five, six, seven, eight surrounding electrons on carbon, so that's great. And then we can check one of the fluorines since they're all the same. So we have one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven, eight for the bond. We have eight valence electrons around fluorine. Beautiful, we're, we're happy with that one. We're satisfied with that uh, drawing since every single one of these atoms satisfies that octet rule. So the next thing to do is check and see if this is polar or not. Again, any way I slice this, any way I slice this, it doesn't matter if I slice it like this, it's always going to be symmetrical. And as a result, we know that this, because it has complete symmetry, we know that this will be nonpolar. The other two checks are, well, there's no valence uh, or lone pair electrons left on carbon, and there's also no metals anywhere, so we don't have an ionic bond anywhere at all. To look at our shape, we see we have our central atom carbon. We see one, two, three, four arms coming off of it and no lone pairs of electrons. And so when we go here, we have four arms, that's tetrahedral, no lone pairs. So this will also be tetrahedral as well. So the shape of this guy will be tetrahedral, tetrahedral. Okay. 
Last structure that we're gonna do together, we have HCN. So I said that's always carbon is the central atom and it's sometimes nitrogen. Well, in this case, carbon will take priority. We already have drawn carbon. It has four valence electrons. And then we also have a hydrogen and then we also have a nitrogen. No, it does not matter which side you draw them on. Okay, uh, going over here, we wanna look at the number of valence electrons. And here you can see that we have hydrogen and it has one valence electron since it's in column number one. So hydrogen, one valence electron. Hydrogen, again, is that exception where we don't want eight surrounding electrons. We only want two. And if we have two surrounding electrons, it is stable. Uh, and that, again, is because hydrogen is such a small atom that it really only wants two uh, valence electrons. Then we want to look at nitrogen. We can see nitrogen's in column number 15 here. So we can see that this guy will have five valence electrons. So let's draw the structure of nitrogen. One, two, three, four, and then we're gonna make a pair of electrons up here, five. Okay, next thing to do then is to start connecting these bonds to one another. I can see that we have two singulars right here. I'm gonna connect those two with each other. I can also see that I have one, two, three singular electrons on carbon and one, two, three singular electrons on nitrogen. Those seem like the perfect little electrons to match up with one another. One, two, and three. So we have a triple bonded nitrogen and a singular bonded uh, hydrogen. If I wanna draw the structure perfectly, keep in mind that all of these bonds represent electrons and these lone pairs also represent negatively charged electrons. Those negative things are gonna try to get as far away from each other as they possibly can. So this is the more correct version where you have, it's like magnets, the two poles that are the same are gonna repel each other. Same thing here, that uh, if you have a nitrogen and those two lone pair electrons, and then also the triple bond, those two are gonna to wanna to get as far away from each other as they can. Counting up our electrons here. We have three different bonds on this carbon and another fourth bond on this carbon, each bond being worth two, four bonds times two electrons, each gives us eight electrons around carbon. Super satisfied with that. We then have this double bonded or the single bonded hydrogen here, two valence electrons. It doesn't make the octet rule, but it does satisfy hydrogen, so we're okay with that. Looking at the nitrogen, we have one, two, three, four, five, six electrons held in these bonds. And then we have two other electrons. So six plus two is eight. Beautiful. We're looking at uh, a balanced octet rule uh, Lewis structure here. Next thing to check then is to check our polarity. Do we have any asymmetry? And you can see that if I cut it this way, that yes, we have a nitrogen on the right, hydrogen on the left. Those clearly are not mirror images of each other. And so the idea then is we want to figure out which one is more electronegative. And if we revisit this electronegativity, whatever's further up or further to the right will be more electronegative. And so if we look at our periodic table, nitrogen's all the way over here to the right, hydrogen's all the way over here to the left. Nitrogen's going to be a lot more electronegative, meaning it will have a stronger pull on the electrons. So as we draw our arrow, then we want to draw our arrow like this, that nitrogen's going to have a stronger pull on those electrons there. And what that'll do then is uh, the arrow shows us that the point is where the negative end is. The plus sign is where the more positive end is. We'd expect more of the electrons to be found on the right side of this molecule. Looking at our shape, we have a carbon with two different bonds or two different arms, I guess, coming off of it. And so, yes, even though this is a triple bond versus a single bond, you can just think of it as a really beefy, uh, I guess that would be its right arm versus a uh, really skinny left arm that looks more like my arm. So looking at the shape then, we have no lone pairs on that carbon. So we would expect this to be a linear, linear shape. Just like that. That is all of the content of Lewis structures packed into one video. I hope that was super helpful to you. Uh, let me know if you have any comments. As always, send me an email or ask me any questions that you have. See you later.